Welcome. My name is Hans Rasmussen, one of the ministers here at the Denver Church of Christ. And if you're joining us today, you weren't here last week, we're in week two of a brand new series we're calling Connect the Dots. And uh, we talked a lot about really this biblical foundation that uh, we need to understand kind of the friends that we need to understand, we want to be, and the friends that we want to have in our lives. And uh, next week, I'm thinking is probably going to be really important for some of us because I want to talk more about kind of the way how we can connect with each other. So I encourage you to come back for that. The week after that, we're going to talk about unfriending. So, uh, you know, because sometimes to, to get where God wants us to be, we need the right people around us, but sometimes we need the wrong people away from us. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But today's title is One Friend Away. And I want to revisit the key thought that we had from last week that's going to lead us through our whole series here. And that's this. Show me your friends, and I will show you your future. Right? Like, if you look at the friends, if you take it and you're the average of your five closest relationships, if you look at the friends around you, it will show you your future. It'll show you where you end up. I love how Andy Stanley says it. He says it this way. He says, your friends will determine the quality and the direction of your life. They really will. And so it'll show us your future. Solomon a couple of thousand years ago, the wisest man who ever lived in, lived in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, he said it this way. He says, walk with the wise and you'll become what? Wise. But the companion of fools suffer, suffers harm. He goes, hey, it, it, it's going to harm you if you're not with the right people. And if you're with the wrong ones, it's going to mess you up. But, but man, we get wisdom from hanging out with the right people. And so last week we built this foundation. We talked about how there's different things that we can miss and why the friendships overall are declining. Talked about increased work hours, the the divorce rate increasing, and the explosion of social media. Right? I got I got a lot of comments about the social media stuff. It was it was interesting to hear this because somebody shared with me goes, "Hey, I've got all these Facebook friends, but then when you asked me to write down five of my closest friends, I couldn't think of one." Go hundreds of friends online, not one real face-to-face relationship. So we talked a bit about texting as well and how that's kind of messing us up and messing up relationships and this phobia of even talking on the phone. Some people got a big crack up about that, of, you know, that there, there's this whole new phobia. People don't want to answer the phone. They just want to text you back. And it's interesting. So we sat down with some close friends the other night for dinner before the, uh, the Rocky Mountain football game. And... Uh, it was a good game, right? Unless you're a CSU fan, right? So the buffs, uh, buffs came in force, uh, right? But, you know, we sat down, and the first thing all of us did was pull out our phone, and we didn't set it right down in the middle not to talk. We all pulled it out to text and see what was going on with our kids. And uh, one of the couples, their babysitter was late and stuck in traffic, and the other babysitter locked the door, and this babysitter didn't have the key. And so there are some times when we're having dinner, you, you got to text. But it was good because we talked about it and said, okay, let's put our phones away and let's just connect. And it was good to be able to do that. You know, but I think so many of us in the world today would say we're so busy. We've got all these things going on. We're connected to the social communities to really connect face-to-face sometimes. And we're longing for something more. And we need these relationships. And, and so there's times where you just go, man, there's this gnawing sense of I'm missing something in my life. And I think lots of times it's the relationships, this deep down, real life relationships. And I think one of the reasons that we, um, we don't do this is, is we look, we think many of us are impoverished relationally. And it's interesting because sociologists, sociologists talk about three different kinds of poverty. There's these three types of poverty. Material poverty, we all get that. Like, I don't have stuff. I don't have food. I don't have different things. But then there's spiritual poverty, where you go, I've got all these things, but I'm missing that spiritual component. But then I think relationally is one where we fall, a lot of us, into that category. We're missing out relationally. We're just not connecting with people in the way that we should. And we we have people all around us. We can be surrounded by a crowd and yet feel very, very lonely. That's relational poverty. And I think we want to be connected, and we need to be connected. That's how God created us. He did it on purpose, that we want to be with other people, and we need, need other people. And it's interesting, because we can long for that community, but sometimes we don't know what we're missing, right? I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to go serve overseas with, like, Hope Worldwide and visit a third world country. But if you've never done it, one, I'd encourage you to do it, because you learn so much, and you get, you get so much. But you go to, to give... And I promise you what ends up happening is you get way more than you give as you're doing that. 
But it's interesting because a couple of days into it, as you're doing this and you're serving these people who oftentimes don't have running water and don't have access to medical care and have so very little, at some point you start to look and go, I'm kind of jealous of these people because they're so connected relationally. There's families and you look and go, man, there's 12 people living in this little shack but they're connected relationally and they're connected to their neighbors and they're connected to the community. And, and there's a piece where you look and go, I want that. And we can be impoverished relationally and go, I've got all this stuff. I've got a great spiritual family. I've got great material things, but we're missing out on the relationships that God created us to have. And I think it, it just helps so much. And so we can come back to our healthy, wealthy lifestyles and go, man, I wish I had more that they had. Well, we can have both. We can live here and and be blessed by God. And like Glenn was saying, bless others with our finances. But we need to have this relational connection because there's something missing and we need it. And so that brings us to our key, key thought for today. And if you're taking notes, it's this. You might be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. You might just be one friend away from from becoming and accomplishing and achieving what God really wants for your life. And we see it again and again in our own lives, but do you not see it in the scriptures again and again where just one person comes into somebody else's life and it changes the entire trajectory of their life and God wants to be, them to be used in the, in the way that God intended. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn over to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look over there in a, in a little bit, but I very clearly want to look at this, this example of the Apostle Paul because I think this shows better than most stories this, this power and this connection of a friendship that just changes the entire course of someone's life. And in Acts chapter 9, in verse 26, it says this. When Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. And so maybe you go, hey, this has happened to me, right? So what's, what's going on here? They're, they're connected with their friends. They're, he's coming over here, and he goes, hey, I want to come and preach. That was on Paul's heart. But what was Paul doing a couple weeks prior to this, before he had this miraculous conversion? He was persecuting the Christians. He's going after him. He's trying to shut down the church. He's literally killing Christians. And so as he comes and goes, I'm changed. I want to come and preach to you guys. They say, um, wait a minute. I know what you were doing two, two weeks ago. I don't think we want you to come to our family group. You're not invited. Right? And so they're feeling all this stuff. And he goes, I just, I don't think it's going to work. But in verse 27, what happens? It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And now in Damascus, he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. What a cool story. How did it start? Well, one, he was changed by God. Has to start there. But then two, somebody else came into his life, Barnabas, and says, hey, I can change this trajectory. I can change what's going on. Here, let me put my, my, my life on the line. Let me put my reputation on the line to help you do what God created you to do. And I go, that's what we need. We need somebody who can help us. But here's what happens sometimes. If you're 16 year old, 16 years old, what do you want? You want another 16 year old friend, right? Because old people are weird, right? You know, you go, I, I want to connect with young people. If you're in college and you're 20-something, you go, I need peers around me. If you're young married, you go, I want young marrieds to help me. But here's the thing that I've found is but you need that intergenerational relationships, right? I mean, think about how it's worked in your life. Because we all need different people in our lives at different times. Younger people need older people, but older people need younger people. Like some of the the best relationships in my life have been these huge age differences, or at least seemingly huge age differences at the time. I can remember when Ann and I first got married, and and we were were loving marriage, and we were having so much fun, and we're serving in the campus, and we're going a million miles an hour, but we did not know how to be married. And I can remember sitting down at uh, in Louisville with the with Wally and Sue Dag at some Italian restaurant. I can't Blue Parrot is that the name of that? You know, Blue Parrot. I mean, like this is 20 years ago, and I remember vividly just them like sharing about marriage. I'm like, you have changed my life. And, and I look back. I don't ever. I don't even remember exactly what it is they said. Anne might be able to tell you, but I think a lot of it just really, you know, how to get along and how to be there together. But it, it helps so much. I think, too, about relationships when we were in Fort Collins where we're serving in the campus ministry and I didn't have a lot of peers. And so these young guys 
campus students, and I'm old, and they told me about it all the time. You know, that these campus students where I go, man, I'm pouring my life into them, but they're giving back just as much to me as I'm giving to them. You know, and it's so cool seeing Ross was one of those guys. You know, he's up here leading songs and, and playing now. And just to see that relationship, I think about Dustin Peckman, who is a full-time minister in L.A. now. And he was just this knuckleheaded kid who barely wanted to come to church. And, you know, he's, he's messing around and doing all these things. And just our friendship and how God used that is just inspiring. And so what I want to do in the last little bit here that we have together is look at three types of friends that I think every person needs. Because we all need these different relationships. And I bet almost every one of us is going to see one area where we need to grow in these relationships. And so we're going to look at the life of King David from the Old Testament. And we're going to look at Samuel, Jonathan, and Nathan. These three, three friends that helped him become who God wanted him to be. So the first one we're going to look at is Samuel. And if you're taking notes, we all need this. We all need a friend who makes us better. So Samuel is this friend who makes you better. So a little, little story here, right? Or a little history in this. So Saul was the king at the time, and different Saul than we were talking about with that became Paul in the New Testament. This is Saul in the Old Testament. He was the king at the time, and the spirit of God had come off of him. He was doing his own thing. He wasn't following God. And so this prophet Samuel is to go and anoint the next king. And Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and he's looking, and he, he comes, the oldest son, and he's assuming that's who it's going to be. And God goes, nope, that's not him. So he goes through all the other sons. And, and Samuel's thinking, this has got to be the guy. He's even better looking than the next guy. And all the way through, they go through all the kids. And Jesse goes, this is it. He goes, do you have any other ones? Because God told me to come, and he says no to all of these guys. He goes, well, I got this one runty kid who's out in the, shep- in the field being a shepherd, but we didn't even bring him in because we, we know he's not the one. So go, go get him. They bring him in, and God says, he's the one. Anoint him. And it's interesting, because that in, at, at the, the outward signs here, and God says, no, I look at the heart of man. And it's in Sam, 1 Samuel 16, verse 12, then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And that, from that day forward, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Not a single person in David's life thought he's the guy. Right? So if you feel like nobody believes in me, well, you're in great company because that's the kind of guys and girls that God loves to use and loves to deal with. But we need the right people in our lives. Nobody ever thought he'd be king, but God put it on one man's heart, Samuel, to say, this is the right guy. Look at his heart. He may not have this outward appearance that's all flashy, but he's got the right heart. Now, here's the thing. Most of us, as we look at our friends, who are they? Most oftentimes, it kind of happens by accident, right? You know, we play on the softball team together. We work together. We take English lit together. They're the guys at the gym or they're, you know, the other moms on the soccer team as we're all carpooling together. That becomes our friends. But what you need to ask yourself about your friends is, do they make you better? Do they make you better? Because you might be one friend away from changing changing the course of your life. You could be one friend away from changing the course of your destiny. So do you have somebody in your life who makes you better? Who's really helping you? Because if you want to get closer to God, you want somebody who's close to God. If you want to get better in your marriage, if you want to get better in your parenting, your business, financially. If you want to be a better leader. If you want to be better with your finances. Well, you want to hang out with people who make you better in those areas. We're really helping you. And at the same time, God wants to use us to help other people become better. Proverbs 27, in verse 17, it says, iron, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. See, we all need somebody who helps make us better. Right? You don't need somebody who beats you down. But you need a friend who, who li- who's there to help you and help you be better. See, David also had a friend named Jonathan. And we all need a friend who, who, who helps us find spiritual strength. And that's the second thing. Jonathan, a friend who helps you find spiritual strength. So you fast forward a little bit. David is anointed as king, and then nothing happens for a little while. Then he goes to war, and he becomes this war hero. And he's doing all these great things, and the people are so excited about what David's doing, they start singing songs about him. 
right? So you got to be pretty famous for people sing songs about you. So Saul, it says that they start singing the song. He says, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain his tens of thousands. And Saul hears that, and he is not excited. He's super jealous, and he, he looks, and he goes, I'm overwhelmed with jealousy. I'm overwhelmed with hatred. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill this kid. Not happy with, with him. He's getting all the attention. I don't want to do this. So Samuel, 1 Samuel 23, verses 15 and 16, says, While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Isn't that interesting? He just goes, he doesn't come in and fix it. He doesn't come and say, I know exactly what to do. He doesn't take out his dad. He says, here's the answer to your problem. Find strength in God. And don't we want to have the easier fixes? Hey, God, if you just would take this boss out of my life. Hey, God, if I can just not have to take this class, right? Because, you know, biochem is the end of all things or whatever it is, right? You know, it could be true, but, but ultimately what we really need is people around us who help us find spiritual strength. Find strength in God. And find it in him. And so when you're down, they lift you up. When you're alone, they comfort you. And I think not just pray for you, but they say, hey, can I pray with you? Because there's strength that comes from us being together. They, maybe they encourage you with scripture. They're connected with you. And I just go, man, when you've had a genuinely bad day, you, you know what I'm talking about with like the genuinely bad day? Where it seems like everything aligns perfectly just to crush you. You know what I'm talking about? You need somebody who is there who goes, I'm going to help you find strength in God. I think it's important for us to do that. You know, I get together with, with, um, with Glenn and with Chip pretty much every week. And we just sit and drink tea or talk and whatever. And just go, man, how can we help each other? And how can we get, gain strength from each other? And it, it's so good because we're, we're helping each other focus on God. You know, a while back here, Frank and Erica Kim just sat down with us and said, hey, you know, we, we want to talk to you. And they actually had us over for a sleepover. It was weird. <laughs> They're like, we, you know, we try and have lunch and it just doesn't work. Come over for a sleepover. And I'm like, <laughs> as Frank is asking me, I go, okay, this is Erica's idea, isn't it? He goes, how'd you guess, right? But it was so good. And we're just talking and we're thinking we're going to do all this business stuff. And just over dinner, we just sat and talked for hours just about how we were doing and where we were at. And he goes, man, we're just worried about you and all the health things that have been coming and Anne in the car accident and how you've been feeling. And, and it just, it was so good because they just pointed us back to God. I go, man, we need friends who lift us up like that, who point us in the right way. Why? Because we're one friend away sometimes from changing the destiny of our lives. So do you have those people who help you find spiritual strength? Because if you don't, you might be one friend away from spiritual ruin. Because we need help sometimes. And we can change it, but we need help. But you know what? Not only do you need it in your life, you have to be a blessing to other people and be that for other people in their life too. Point them to God. You don't have to have all the answers. Right? Somebody goes, hey, can you get with me and help me? Oftentimes we think, well, I don't know the Bible that well. I don't know how to do that. How can I figure I'm not a counselor. But you don't have to be to point people back to God and help people find strength in God. Because you know what happens if we're the ones who go, let me fix your problem. I know how to do that. I know what to do. Let me do that. You know what happens when they have problems? What do they want you to do? They want you to fix it. What do we really want to have happen? We want God to fix it. Because he's way smarter than we are. And he created us. And it's what he wants. And so sometimes we just need to open up enough to have those friends who help us. So we're going to look at those friends that help us get better. Those friends that help us find spiritual strength. And then finally, there's Nathan that's in David's life. And this is the third type of friend that I think we all need. Sometimes we don't want. But if you're taking notes, we need a friend who will do this, who will tell us the truth. You need a friend who's going to tell you the truth. You all need that kind of friend. We all need that kind of friend. Because here's what happened to David. We know that he's a man after God's own heart. He takes out David, Goliath. He, he's the war hero. He, he takes over as king, and he's having a great time. But then it says at, in the springtime when all the kings are supposed to be at war, what does he start doing? He starts looking where he's not supposed to be looking. And he's up on his rooftop as it looks over the whole town, and he's watching some gal take a bath. 
you know, getting into that pornography is ultimately what that, what that is. So he commits adultery with her to try and hide it. He kills her husband. And he takes her into their home and takes her as his wife and is going to raise this kid as his own. And ultimately, God, it just breaks the heart of God. He looks and goes, man, this David, the man after my own heart, and he's not quite getting it. So God sends a man, Nathan, to go down and tell him the truth. And Nathan sits him down and says, hey, David, let me tell you this little story. So Nathan tells him this story about there's a guy who has one little lamb. And he loves this lamb and he, it stays in with his house with him and he eats with him at his table. It's his most prized possession. And there's a rich guy that lives up the road and there's a traveler coming to visit the rich guy. And so he, he goes and he, rather than taking one of his um, sheep to serve as meal for his friend that's coming in, he goes and takes the one little lamb away from this poor guy, kills it and serves it to his friend. David hears the story and is just infuriated. And he says, well, I don't, you know, this guy, it cannot go on. I cannot bear it that he has done this. We need to kill this guy. And Nathan says to him something that I think got his attention. He says, you are the man. This isn't the good kind of man, right? You know, because people are like, hey, you the man. This is not that kind of thing. Because you're the man. You had everything. You had anything at your disposal. You have all these wives and all these concubines and all that you could do. And you took away the one wife of one of your soldiers. And so suddenly David sees what he hadn't seen before. He saw that he broke the heart of God. He saw that he had sinned against God and against his friend and done all these things. And, and if you go and read Psalm 51... It is a great story. It's a psalm that David wrote after he's caught in this and he's trying to figure out, how do I get my head around this and how do I get connected back with God? It's such a great prayer. And if you're struggling with that, it'd be a great thing to read. But also, when was the last time you had a friend who could confront you like this? You go, I haven't killed anybody lately, so I haven't needed it, right? Well, that's good. But I don't think it all started with David with just all of a sudden he wakes up one day and kills somebody. It started little by little. It's that slow fade. And don't we need people in our lives who just go, hey, bro, it seemed like you're kind of taking a second look at that. Hey, sis, you, you seem really distant. Or, wow, you, you're really angry lately. Is something wrong? We all need to be those friends who, who, who speak the truth. Or, hey, I see something you don't see. Not that I'm holier than thou, but I love you and I want to be your friend and I want you to make it to heaven. I want to point you back to God. But oftentimes our sin keeps us from being able to do that. And we we need people to help us. We need people to help us apply sometimes those scriptures that we really want to live out. I'm so thankful for people in my life over the years who've helped me to be what God wants me to be. To get in real relationships and really, really be there to connect. Because some of us are never going to become what God wants us to become without relationships like this. Because maybe you look and go, I'm relationally impoverished. If you had a hard time coming up with those five friends, you're relationally impoverished. And God doesn't want you to be stuck that way. Because if you go, I got one, I got two, that's all I need. Here's what happens. One or two, maybe they got something going on in their life and they can't be there for you. We got four or five. Typically not everybody's messed up all at the same time. Right? <laughs> And we can help each other and we can be there. There's times where you go, whoa, we're all messed up. And then it's great to get together and you can all cry together, right? You go, misery loves company. And we need that. But I think we need to realize that, man, you need six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen friends like this who meet different needs in different ways and who can pour your life into one another, who you can serve one another, you can do life together, you can encourage one another, you can bless one another, you can give to one another, you can exhort one another. You can spur one another on. We all need a a few friends who are going to help us change the course of our lives. Who are going to change our destiny. And I think for some of us, we look, I look at sometimes people's friends and I go, hmm, if I look at your friends and I can kind of plan out your future, I get concerned sometimes. Because I look and I go, okay, if those are your best friends, here's what your future is going to hold. Probably a new addiction that you don't already have. You go, ooh, I look at your friends and you're probably going to lead towards a divorce because they're a bunch of guys who don't really care about their, their wives. 
Are there a bunch of women who talk bad about their husbands all the time? They just go, if you're closest friends, you go, do you want your life to look like that? Is there life what you'd want to share a Sunday morning at church? Well, then maybe you've got to invest in better friendships. Not blow those people off completely. Help them. But you can't have all the people surrounding you like that. It's so easy in school. New semester. All exciting. Got a chance to pick who you're going to be friends with. Who you're going to invest your life with. How that's going to look like. You need people who are going to help you. But I think for some of us, it's not going to be this dramatic thing. It's going to be, well, I just kind of things are how they are. And my future holds lukewarmness. And it should be shocking because we're just, you know, thinking about building up material things and being comfortable and not having to do too much. And I'll show up on Sunday, but don't get, don't push, push it, Hans, or I won't, you know. And, and we can just go, this is what my life holds in store. And we're not shocked by it because we surround ourselves with other people like that. And it seems like it's great because we're all just comfortable together. But we're not living out the dream that God has for us. We're not doing the things that God has called us to do. We're not excited about a relationship with God. We're not excited about a relationship with other people. We're not excited about, you know, reaching out to other people and helping them know God the way that we know God and be changed by him. Because if we're not being changed, it's not very motivating to go, hey, it'll change you because I'm boring. No, we've got to be changed by God so we're encouraged and, and want to help other people change. But I've been super encouraged with the, with the teen ministry and the campus ministry. They're going out, they're, they're sharing, and you're just, hey, you want to come to Bible talk? You want to, we got buff night at CSU, or CU. Oh my gosh, I almost said CSU. We got buff night at CU, and come and learn about the Bible and hang out. Man, the teens went out and invited to the teen rally. You know, doing that and, and getting in there. Or, you know, coming up, we've got this great hope project of getting... Getting stuff together for the homeless people. Taking, taking that, uh, that's coming up here, it's in your newsletter. But, you know, getting with those homeless packs. You go, hey, maybe this would be a great way to reach out to my friend. What can you get excited about and do that? Because if you want to, to have a better marriage, well, maybe you're just one friendship away. One friendship away that's going to help you. You go, I need help overcoming this addiction. Well, maybe you're just one friendship away of getting the help that you really need. Or you go, man, I'm depressed and I'm lonely. Well, maybe God says, hey, you're just one friendship away from learning how to deal with that and, and grow in it. You go, I want to be a stronger leader. I want to be a better parent. I want to tap more into the power of God. You can be just one friend away from all of that. Or maybe you're new today. You go, I don't even know anybody here. Well, maybe you're one friend away from really knowing Jesus, being changed by him in the way that he wants to. I encourage you to talk to somebody here. Come find me afterwards. Because you're one friend away. Because I promise if you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. So what are those friends that we, we, we need? Well, you've got to do like your mama said. You've got to be the kind of friend that you want to have. Right? Do unto others. And I go, sometimes you go, I don't have that. And I want that. Well, how are you doing on the other end of that? Are you there pointing people to God, helping people be better? Are you there um, and really just being a great friend and telling the truth? Because we've got to do this together. And be there together. So you got to love them enough to help them be better. To help them find their strength in God. And love them enough to tell the truth. Because iron sharpens iron. And that's what we need for each other. But a companion of fools, man, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you bad. And that's not what we want. And that's what we need. And you go, I'd love that. I'd love to get connected. Well, you can do it digitally and text in. A joy to 877, and uh, we'll get you connected with a family group in your area in some way, shape, or form. But, or you go, I'm not techie like that at all. Well, you can talk face-to-face. We'd encourage you to do that, too, and, and just be in there. And I'm excited for the men. Um, we've, we've got this band of brothers that we're starting here in a few weeks. And um, we're going to meet together and just talk about how can we really be like this? How can we help each other and be friends that we need to be and doing that? So you can t- talk to me about more information on that or text in. And, we, and again, the, the Hope Projects, and get uh, text updates on that all together. But ultimately, we're just saying, hey, what do we want to do? We don't want to be just a group of people that come together on Sundays, but we want to connect these dots, connect our hearts to each other, to really be the friends that we need to have to, to change our destiny, but be the friends that we need to change other people's destiny as well. Amen?